In the evening on Sunday, May 1, 2011, I was home with my wife Judy when our son Dan called. He asked if I'd heard the news. I hadn't, so I turned on the television to watch the reports and to hear President Obama announce the death of Osama bin Laden. Dan stayed on the phone so we could hear the details together. When we finally said goodbye, I thought about what the previous 10 years had meant to our family. Like many others, Dan was fired up after September 11th, and he joined the Army. Dan is a very intelligent guy, and his test scores when he joined were very high. He could have gotten any job the Army had, but he wanted to be an infantryman. So he went to Fort Benning, where on graduation from boot camp, his mother affixed the blue braid to his uniform, making him one of those whose profession is combat, which, by the way, is only 11% of the Army. We respect every service the soldiers do, but the ones who wear that braid deserve it the most. When the invasion of Iraq took place in March of 2003, he was in the 2nd Infantry Division in Korea. By 2005, he'd been assigned to the 3rd Division and was deployed to Iraq near Tikrit, Saddam's hometown. He and his mates referred to themselves as steely-eyed killers and the ones who'd give the martyrs what they want. They're also the ones whose parents worry the most. Sometimes infantry platoons intentionally draw fire. It's not a strategy they favor, but it can be the only way to get the enemy to reveal themselves. The point is, they're exposed more than any of the others. And Dan's letters confirmed that he had been fired on and had fired back on a pretty regular basis. He'd even been through multiple IED attacks, one of which killed his company commander. His mother and I hoped the sedan bearing the chaplain wouldn't come. It wasn't on our minds constantly, but sometimes the thought would overcome me, and I knew the same paralyzing fear at times gripped my wife. Neither of us knew when it would come, but we always knew why. In 2007, I went to Iraq as a civilian contractor with Lockheed Martin, the big defense and aerospace company. I knew I wouldn't be in the kind of danger Dan had been in, and I wasn't. But because of the nature of my work, I did end up being in far more hostile neighborhoods than I expected, and was repeatedly fired on. Dan was on his second deployment while I was there, so Judy had both of us to worry about. In June of 2008, I went to Afghanistan, and Danny was out of the Army, so things got better for Judy. By 2011, when we were listening to the President on TV, and glad for the destruction of a particularly evil man, our family was finally passed most of the personal difficulties he wrought. But I thought that night, and still think, what of the others? What I'd like to tell you about now is what it was like for me in Iraq and Afghanistan. And by the time I'm through, you'll see why mine was such a special perspective. Context and perspective really matter. What I write or say is of value if it's of use or if it improves another life. For that to happen, there has to be context. If the idea I seek to convey is to have value to you, it can't be plucked from the middle of my experience and presented to you without offering the circumstances or context that made the idea valuable to me. The program I was on was the Persistent Threat Detection System, or PTDS. PTIDS, as we called it, is a kite balloon, also referred to as a tethered aerostat, that carries a weapons detection system and a very sophisticated camera. It's an ISR asset. ISR stands for Intelligence, Surveillance, or Reconnaissance. And the PTID system is an element of the ISR network, which also includes satellites, manned aircraft, drones, other balloons, tower cameras, and weapons detection systems. It doesn't include special operations, the CIA, and people or units that are considered military intelligence but those operators and units depend on the ISR assets and network to find and kill the enemy. Conventional units use ISR assets for base defense and mission support, too. The ISR network gives the United States the high ground. 2007, the year of the surge, was the worst year of the Iraq War for the United States. May was the worst month of that year, with 126 U.S. military deaths and thousands of Iraqis have been dying due to the war each month for the previous two years. We landed in Baghdad on the afternoon of Saturday, May 5th. 
I was 51 years old, which was about the average age of the nine guys on my team. We were all employees of Lockheed Martin, and most of us had been hired two or three months before. I was the only member of our team who wasn't ex-military or military contractor with extensive recent experience. Jeff Ballard, by far the biggest guy on the team, was the only African American. The rest of us were white. Bill Dunbar is a good old boy from L.A., Lower Arkansas. Barry Boldman is an airframe and power plant mechanic who has worked for several airlines. Steve Carter is retired Navy. He's married to a Filipino who he loves but would rather not live with, which is an arrangement she's probably happy with. Don Craig is an unmarried retired sailor and a bodybuilder. Winston Rogers worked in Iraq for security contractors in 2004 and 2005, and he knows his way around that war zone. Vince is a proud Massachusetts liberal. And Rick Lawrence is the smartest guy on the team, and the only one other than me that has operational experience with kite balloons. We were Team 4, the third PTDS team to operate in Iraq. The first group had been in place since 2004 on Camp Slayer in Baghdad. One of our teammates, Barry, was with the original team. Team 2 had recently started operations in Afghanistan, and Team 3 had been a FOB loyalty in East Baghdad for the previous three months since February. By 2014, there were dozens of sites in Afghanistan. Site 4 was eventually installed on FOB Justice in North Baghdad. That was where my team and I were supposed to end up, but it didn't work out that way. The kite balloon that we were sent to Baghdad to assemble and operate would float an L3 Communications Incorporated Westcam MX-20 gyroscopically stabilized multispectral airborne imaging system, which is a very sophisticated and expensive camera. The balloon also carried the base station for a weapons detection system called UTAMS. The camera, which was the same as the one carried by the Predator drone, was actually three cameras, two electro-optic cameras, one wide angle and the other had a narrow field of view for zooming in on things, and the third camera was infrared for night vision and seeing through haze. UTAMS was a system that listened for certain acoustic signatures. When it heard something it recognized, like a mortar being fired or an IED explosion, the system would instantly point the camera to the source of the sound. It didn't always work, but when it did, the change was abrupt. You could go from a routine scene of a road you've been scanning every morning for the last three weeks and seeing nothing but stray dogs to an IED explosion at a checkpoint or troops under fire in a second. The balloon is similar to other lighter than aircraft, like blimps, which are made of the same materials and in a similar fashion. Corporate and military people don't call them kite balloons. That's not sexy. To them, they're aerostats. Which is right, but it's less descriptive, because an aerostat is any lighter than aircraft that can remain at a fixed altitude. I first saw kite balloons in World War II newsreels. They were used then to prevent low-level strafing and bombing runs, and they were called barrage balloons. But in the language of aerostation, the field of air vehicles and conveyances known as lighter than air, a field which is related to but distinct from aviation, an aerodynamically shaped balloon on a tether is a kite balloon. That's their proper name. Aerostation has a very rich history. It goes back to the 18th century with hot air balloons and hydrogen balloons in France to Count von Zeppelin in Germany and the first aerial bombardments in World War I, to the Hindenburg and U.S. Navy dirigibles in the 1930s, and then Navy blimps used for anti-submarine warfare in World War II. Modern airships include complicated hybrids and huge, oddly configured, non-rigid airships, mostly for military missions, but also for heavy lift and transportation. The tethered aerostat programs to use the nomenclature of the companies that developed them, has a lot of history too, going back to the late 1960s. I was part of that. I worked on the TARS program, which is the Tethered Aerostat Radar System in the 1980s, and SBAS, the Sea-Based Aerostat System. Originally, TARS was under Air Defense Command and was used to keep an eye on the Russians as they motored in and out of Cuba, 
But by 1985, when I joined RCA Aerostat Systems, they were used for that and drug interdiction. There were two sites run by the Air Force. The one on Kudjo Key, one of the Florida Keys, was the one whose radar could see to Cuba. The other site was on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, adjacent to the Kennedy Space Center. I spent far more time with RCA on the sea base system, first as a quality control engineer and then as a project engineer. The sea based aerostat system is the one on which the system in Iraq was based. Both are mobile. The one mounted on the boat is much more readily moved about. The PTID system requires disassembly and roads to get about, but it's a mobile system too. The one that went to Iraq with us was assembled in Florida first and we put it back together again in Baghdad, and then it was moved to another location in the city a few years later. It wasn't something you'd want to do real often, but you could when you had to. We put ours together during the second week in May of 2007 on Camp Slayer on the Victory Base Complex. The DBC was the primary location for American forces in Iraq. It included multinational division Baghdad headquarters, where Generals Petraeus and Odierno lived. The international airport was there, too, as were numerous army camps and multiple palaces and residences formerly occupied by Saddam Hussein and his notorious son, Zude and Kusay. For the next few weeks after the balloon was inflated, we were on mission most of the time, coming down only to avoid bad weather or to add helium. There were a lot of IEDs vehicle-borne IEDs and suicide bombers in Baghdad in 2007. Nationwide, there had been over 20,000 roadside bomb attacks in the first seven months of the year. A lot of indirect fire, mortars and rockets, were being launched too, so there was a tremendous need for reconnaissance. The west end of the infamous Route Irish was right under our nose. It entered the airport property less than a mile from the balloon site. In May of 2007, Irish was not the most dangerous road in the world, as it had been dubbed in 2005, when the charge for one car for the 10-kilometer trip from the airport to the green zone was $3,000. In fact, that portion of the city, the southwest quarter, was relatively quiet compared to the east side, which included Sodder City. Fob Loyalty, which housed Balloon Site 3, was over there, and it was a favorite target for many of the Mahdi Army cells, operating out of Sauter City and elsewhere. The green zone in the middle of town was getting a lot of fire then. One night the operator at Site 3 spotted a rocket team in a soccer stadium firing on the compound that housed the American Embassy. That was an incident that PM Russ, which was the Army office we worked for, qualified as a quote good news story and about the only one that made the news back home. The rocket team was killed with missiles, and the video from the PTIT's camera was declassified and shown on the CBS Evening News. It wasn't as intense as it was elsewhere, but there was warfare around Site 1. One of my first times on the camera, we saw a running battle in al Atiba, one of the neighborhoods just outside the wall. At about 2000, which was about an hour after sunset, I had just come into the GCS, which was our ground control station to take my hour on the camera, relieving Don, who had moved over to the Merck station, just as the camera slewed to the Sunni neighborhood a mile east of the site. The Merck is the internet chat application that's the primary means of communication between the PTIDS operation and the supported TOC or Tactical Operations Center. Most of the time, the UTAM service request doesn't take the camera to the exact spot of the sound it's acting on, but this time it was close so it only took a few seconds to locate a one-story Iraqi police station that was under fire. Police were on the roof taking cover behind the parapets as three vehicles entered the courtyard and several IP jumped out of the trucks and took up positions around the building. The police on the roof were apparently unsure where the enemy was. I zoomed out far enough to see about six houses across the street to the north and quickly panned west and then back east to look for the shooters. When I found them, the first thing to do was to count them and identify their weapons and have Don enter that in the Merc chat. The barrel on one of the weapons is white, so we knew it had just been fired. The hot shell casings on the ground indicate he had been firing from this position already. In a second, another guy comes into the frame at the top, and one of the others runs north with him, 
So now there's fighters in multiple locations. To keep track of the changing battle with one camera, I had to zoom out. This image isn't how it looked with the camera, but it demonstrates what I did. In the wider shot, I could see the guy firing on the IP station and the others who were on the move. The first group split again, with half of them running to a house on the south edge of the neighborhood, where they joined another group on a roof. The video feed goes to the talk, so the army is watching and responding. At times, they're also telling me what to do with the camera. We don't ask what they're doing, but the assumption was that they were dispatching a quick reaction force to the scene. He's firing the RPG in the direction of a Shia neighborhood, maybe to a specific target, but maybe not. A lot of these guys just fire and let the result be a matter of God's will. From there, the first group went north a few blocks to an empty lot where spectators watched them fire mortars into the same neighborhood they just fired the RPG into. All the weapons were then put in this car and driven to a home nearby where they were stashed in a trash pile in the backyard. Here you can see the family dog wagging his tail as the weapons that are still hot are being unloaded and hidden, but not from us. These scenes were used for training and promotion, which is why they were unclassified originally, and this mission was an outstanding example of what the system was capable of. It was gratifying for me as a camera operator. At this point, with the location of the weapons cache recorded, it wasn't long before the Army was on the scene to pick them up. The camera reticle, the crosshairs in the center, are still on the yard where the weapons were stashed. Two Humvees and a Bradley fighting vehicle in the top of the frame and two more vehicles in the bottom are on their way to seize all the weapons. One of the other overhead assets, maybe a Predator UAV, was probably following the car. We never heard if they caught the guy who drove away or any other details, which was typical for the missions at Site 1. No one followed up in most cases, either from our end or the Army's. We just got our assignments, completed the scans, responded to events, and went on to the next task. Leave was granted every four months, and since everyone on a team started at the same time, everyone was eligible for their break at the same time, too. To fill in for the guys at Site 3 who were on leave or quitting, some of us on Team 4 went over there. I got there on July 3rd. I was supposed to be there as a night shift supervisor for three weeks, but on July 4th they made me Site Lead, and I ended up running the site for four months. Site 3 was starkly different from Site 1 and every other place I'd ever been. It was on forward operating base loyalty in East Baghdad specifically the Bala Diyat neighborhood. Previously, it was the headquarters for Saddam's secret police, the Mukhabarat, and a prison. So it got special attention from our pilots and troops during the invasion. Iraqi commanders and corner officers were hit, and the buildings their subordinates occupied were smart-bombed during the early stages of the invasion, if not the first night. But many of the buildings were left intact, so the U.S. Army could occupy them later. From the unclassified communications I'd been a party to, and there were plenty, I knew before I got there that the relationship between the Lockheed crew and the Army was very bad, and the operation at the site was in trouble. It was the first site in Iraq since the original one was installed in 2004. Planning and setup was poor, and the crew wasn't prepared. The result was too much downtime and mission interruptions. The Army Brigade at Loyalty was aware of the potential, but the performance from the crew and the system that Lockheed had installed was inadequate. My first night there, we worked on solving the main problem, which was patching holes in the balloon and stopping the leaks. It's a high-tech device, this aerospace inflatable with cameras and weapons detection systems laced to it, but the basics of the aerostat, a fabric assembly made with adhesive and heat seals, are simple. It's coated fabric that contains helium, and if there are holes in it, it doesn't. Finding the holes is an uncomplicated and labor-intensive exercise. It's done by putting mildly soapy water on the balloon with a pressure washer and looking for bubbles and then patching the holes with adhesive and fabric patches. 
Sometimes holes can be seen without the bubbles, but often they can't. So the same method used to find pinholes in inner tubes is used with aerostats and blimps. And it's what we did every night we could for seven weeks. It had to be done at night. It was far too dangerous to bring the balloon down during the day. Rocket and mortar attacks were common. There was a sniper and RPGs were occasionally being fired at the guard towers. My first night there, Don Craig and I went up to do it. It's done from an aerial lift way above the wall with a bright white light to spot the bubbles. We were not only visible for miles around, we were a very prominent feature of the skyline. It was an insanely dangerous position. A few days later we did it again. This time Ron Lanier went up with me. A couple hours before daylight, with sweat pouring out from under my ballistic vest and helmet, just about the time when I stopped thinking about our circumstances, we heard gunfire. Tracers came over the wall near the guard tower and towards us. The troops in the tower fired back and more rounds came in. Terror seized me, and I had the urge to leap out of the basket just like those who jump from burning buildings. Two broken legs seemed better than a rifle bullet in just about any part of my body. But rather than jump, Ron and I got as small as we could as I swung the boom away from the balloon and took us down at a sickeningly slow pace. The rest of the crew ran behind T-walls long before Ron and I got down. When we joined them, we talked about what happened and admitted to each other the balloon probably had more holes. We did that seven times in six weeks and eventually stopped all the leaks. After the time Ron and I were fired on, the army guarded us by putting troops out in the neighborhood outside the wall, and twice they had Apache helicopters over us the whole time the balloon was down. Persevering through that difficult and dangerous task of repairing the balloon was an accomplishment I'm proud of. Before that was done, it couldn't remain a law for more than six days. Afterward, we set a program record by staying in the air for 25 days. Despite this and other accomplishments, that completely rectified the bad relationship with the Army. I was told not to return to FOB loyalty when I got back from my first R&R &R on October 2nd. The stated reasons were because I was abrasive and tried to tell the Army what to do, both of which were ridiculous. No civilian contractor can tell the Army what to do in a war, and trying would bring an immediate and harsh rebuke. And being abrasive shouldn't matter if you're helping win a war, under those circumstances, you need to be able to take more than abrasion. But my boss on the FOB, a major with a Napoleon complex and a hater of civilian contractors, disposed of us on a whim. When I was appointed site lead, I was the sixth one on a site that had only been in operation for four months. I lasted three months, much longer than any of the others. But when the major called for my removal, my locking boss just said, yes, sir. The memoir that I wrote about my time in Iraq and Afghanistan includes descriptions of events, people, cultures, travels, occupations, and technology. And it's about the effect that such a life has on anyone who lives it. The pitch for the movie might be Catch-22 or MASH at the office in Iraq. Catch-22 was about absurd bureaucracy in World War II. We certainly had that in the War on Terror. The characters in MASH included principled surgeons and nurses at odds with unprincipled and corrupt officers. I knew both types. And every day we were in the office, where loyalty, accomplishment, humor, and friendship are often disrupted by disloyalty in politics. An unfortunate event led to me being able to try to keep my job on Site 3. The day after I got back from R&R &R in Greece, a lightning storm passed over Baghdad. By then, the third site, Site 4 on FOB Justice, the one that I was originally supposed to lead, was operating. Lightning was in striking distance of all three sites, and the balloon at Site 3 was hit. The crew did a fantastic job to recover it and get it on the tower, but it was daylight, so while they were trying to patch the holes and find all the other damage, an RPG was fired through it. Being without a PTID system in that part of the city, 
after getting used to the coverage it provided, was something the Army couldn't stand. General Petraeus himself had noted the system's value, so the balloon at Site 1 was to be deflated and sent to Site 3. So I was sent back to oversee the preparations for inflating the balloon and getting that site back in operation. Being there made it possible for me to write to the brigade commander, Colonel Bannister, to ask him to keep me and explain why he should. On another base, I wouldn't have been given the credentials that would have allowed me to send a classified email to Bannister's account. But at Site 3 on FOB Loyalty, I already had the credentials. Stepping out of the chain of command was a big deal to my boss, and to his. And it didn't change anything, except to temporarily curtail my career options. They sent me back to Site 1, where I stayed until my second r and at the end of January. Judy and I met in Paris for that. And then, in February of 2008, I worked at Site 4 on FOB Justice. Which, by the way, is where they hung Saddam Hussein. Then in May, after a full year out of the United States, I went home for three weeks. Delaware is a great place to live, and I love my home there. Tax laws affect behavior, and there's no better example of that than how the break that I got on my federal income tax kept me away. The law says that if you are out of the United States for 330 days out of any consecutive 365-day period, you're exempt on the first $84,500 of income. That's a lot of dough. So I stayed off U.S. soil for 11 months. It was the longest period I'd ever been away from home, and returning to the house I built to be with the woman I love was beautiful. Three weeks from buying a flash. In March of 2008, two months before I left Iraq, I asked to be transferred to Afghanistan. The request was granted, so my destination on May 27th was Wazakwa, Paktika Province, Afghanistan, by way of Kuwait and Bagram Air Force Base, which is south of the city of the same name founded by Alexander the Great. The C-17 from Kuwait landed at 3 a.m., and the next flight out of there to Wazakwa wasn't until late in the morning, so I waited at the USO and tried to sleep, but I couldn't. After sunrise, I was able to get my first look at the Hindu Kush Mountains. Bagram is on a 5,000 foot high plateau. The air is cool, dry, and clear, so the mountains seem nearer than they are. I compared the view and the feeling with what I'd seen and how it felt in Iraq when I first got there. The first hours in Afghanistan were much better. The mooring platform and some of the crew had been on Site W in Wazakwa for six months but they hadn't started operating the system. Mike Proudfoot, the country manager in Afghanistan, said they were nearly ready to inflate the balloon, and if I got there in time, I could help. So I didn't stop to rest in Bagram, even though by the time I landed there, I'd been traveling for 26 hours. All the flights in Baghdad were in Blackhawks. The trip to Wazakwa was my first in a Chinook, and there would be many more. We stopped five times on the way for people to get out and to drop off supplies and mail and to load stuff in, too. I helped at each stop. Eventually, I was the only passenger, and the only gear left was mine. It was early afternoon, and I'd been traveling for 36 hours. The terrain hadn't changed for the last hour, so there was no point in any more sightseeing. I had to lay down, so I stretched out on the seats, which were webbing riveted to aluminum tubing. They're uncomfortable for sitting, but lying on them is worse. It occurred to me that I didn't have to get off the flight when we got there. I'd seen nothing but desert, dry riverbeds, and low, utterly barren mountains for many miles. And each outpost was worse than the last. At each, I dreaded someone in the flight crew would mouth the words, Wazakwa, or This is You, and I would have to get out to stay at one of these extremely unappealing places. When we finally got there, we passed the fob and turned back to land into the wind. What I saw produced the same dread I felt at the other stops. I didn't want to be here either, and I wished again that this wasn't the end of the flight. But as we flew over the perimeter wall on the south side of the helicopter landing zone, I saw the balloon sight. By then, the thoughts of what I'd done and where I was had become dark. When I saw the mooring platform and the sight from the air, my mood darkened more. Things weren't right here. 
Mike told me that they were ready to inflate the balloon, which is why I pushed so hard to get there. But they weren't ready. The tower wasn't up, the mooring cone wasn't attached to it, and there was no one on the platform working even though it was the middle of the day. The site wasn't even finished. Piles of stone were on the ground still to be spread. And what was really disturbing was that there was no blast protection around three sides of the GCS and the TMOS, and neither had overhead protection. No detonation screens or even sandbags. The two shelters we would occupy 24 hours a day were exposed, and the site was in one corner of the FOB on a perimeter wall, which was just one HESCO tall, or about six feet. If the site had been graded for force protection, it would have gotten an F. I thought again that I could just stay on board and go back to Bagram and then home. I even hesitated when they told me to get off, but I was too tired to go back, so I put on my backpack, picked up my two duffels, and walked down the ramp. I'd remained in Wasaqua with an unusual assortment of co-workers for almost two months. The first two weeks would be spent preparing to inflate the balloon. That went reasonably well. It only took a couple days to get it fully operational. But then we did nothing with it for another two weeks because the Polish Army unit that was there had no use for it. They were a civilian affairs unit, so they were glad to avoid the Taliban, who didn't seem to be around much anyway. Eventually, the Poles gave us daily assignments, but they were nothing but route scans. For most of July, we'd spend all day and night watching the dirt roads between villages that had almost no traffic on them. I was on the night shift, and there were many nights when there was literally no one within sight. There were no missions to watch. The Poles rarely left the FOB, and the Americans who were there, members of the famed 101st Airborne Division, ventured outside even less. The society was so far behind that at night, for as far as I could see, and under the best conditions I could see 60 miles, no more than 10 lights were shining. A couple of villages had some street lights powered by solar panels, but otherwise the countryside and villages were utterly dark. The village of Wazakwa had two cobblestone streets whose length were about a quarter mile each, and those were the only paved streets or surfaces we could see. The entire province, which has a population of 400,000, has only 150 miles of paved roads. It's three times bigger than Delaware, which has 14,000 miles of surface streets and highways. Our medical officer on the FOB, Captain Ellis, had been deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan six times. He was bitter about that, but he was a good officer and did his job well. One day, while he and I happened to be shaving at the sinks in the shower house at the same time, a specialist came in and told him the people he was supposed to meet at 1400 were at the ECP. He looked at his watch and said, let them wait, they can inshallah. He said the mandatory Islamic response for anything that one plans to do, which means, if God wills, as if to say, they can kiss my ass. I asked him what his meeting was about. He explained how pharmacists poison their customers in Afghanistan. They sell medication to the parents of sick children by the color of the pill. Red pills cost more than another color, say blue, which are more than another, maybe yellow. No matter the illness or symptoms, the patient gets what he pays for by color. Ellis said, I had a three-year-old kid brought to me and a four-year-old. Another kid was 11. A 13-year-old was brought in three times. Every time I had to give him CPR. The last time he died. He was on 20 different meds. His parents kept buying more expensive colors till he died. I can't stand this anymore. I hate the damn army. These guys that are waiting outside, the pharmacists, I asked them to come in here to talk about how they're killing their people, and they blew me off. So I had them arrested. They're sitting out there now in zip cuffs. I'll teach them to mess with me. There's a doctor in one of the villages, too. He's not very good, but he is trying. These pharmacists are another thing. Nothing matters to them but the money. Captain Ellis was a good medic, not a doctor. But the people from the nearby villages came to the FOB for help, with conditions that were way beyond what Ellis was officially qualified to handle. His boss, a colonel in Bagram, ordered all the medics on the FOBs not to treat any of the locals. Ellis did it anyway. 
Before I left for the last time, I saw a man with a six-year-old boy in his arms on the fob. Blinding eye diseases are endemic in Afghanistan, and eye infections in children are common. The boy was there because of a severe infection. If the father had acted sooner, it wouldn't have been necessary. But Ellis told him to bring his son back the next day so he could perform surgery to remove his son's eyes. Being forced to deal with such matters was why Ellis said he hated the army. The plateau we were on was 7,500 feet above sea level, half a mile higher than Denver. That coupled with the clean air and no light pollution made the view of the stars at night magnificent. It would become miserable in the winter, but in the summer the weather was good, and it made me glad I wasn't in Baghdad. Weather was a constant concern for balloon operators, with the main hazard in Wazakwa in the summer being dust devils that would build on the desert most afternoons. On July 25th, one hit the balloon, breaking the tether. The guys on duty sent the command to open the helium valve and deflate the balloon. The Army found it a few miles away and drug it back. They literally drug it with a truck. Without a balloon, we were shut down, so a few of us were sent to other sites. I went to Site Z, which was on Fob Zormat, about 100 miles northeast. But the balloon there was damaged by Taliban rockets the day after I got there so I only stayed for eight days. One of the rockets landed about 30 feet from me, but I was behind cover. If I hadn't have been, it would have killed me. Conditions there were unsafe and the crew was incompetent and hostile, so I was real glad to leave. Traveling in the war zones can be difficult and time consuming. There are no published schedules and delays are common. It took six days for a flight to come into Zormat, and when it did, I took it. It almost didn't matter where it was going because anywhere was better than where I was. It turned out that the Blackhawks had stopped in Zormat were taking a general and some of his staff to Salerno, a big fob in Coast Province, that had a runway. So from there, it took less than a day to land a ride on a C-130 to Bagram. I waited with soldiers from Fob Tillman who were on their way home. Listening to their stories and their genuine interest in mine really lifted my spirits. I was stuck in Bagram until the end of August, waiting for the new balloon and equipment to come for the site in Wazakwa. While there, I worked on the inflation procedure and exercised with Navy SEALs, Air Force Special Forces, Recon Marines, and Army Rangers. SF units from France and Canada were at the big gym on the west side of the base, too, and it was fun to watch all the war fighters work out their frustrations after a hard day's work. It was a little disturbing, too which caused me to research what the lasting effect of their experiences might be. At the end of September, I was due for an r, &R which I took with my lovely wife in Spain and Portugal. By then, I was a full-fledged expatriate. Being out of the United States so long made me less aware of American politics, professional sports, and other things that I was very interested in before. There were good and bad aspects of that status. But it was undeniable that the behavior modification that the tax policy produced had its effect. I didn't mind discovering the things that didn't matter. When I got back to Baghdad after my first r, &R they told me that I wouldn't be in charge of Site 3. This time it was good news. I was to join two others on the Tiger team, who were the people who tend to extraordinary events and needs, and my first assignment was to plan the next site, which would be in the Afghani capital. Until then, I hadn't been on the ground outside the wire. On October 20th, I went to Kabul in a three-vehicle convoy with Steve Wolf, who was the in-country PM Rush representative for the project. Despite his cynicism, and at times because of it, Steve was a good guy. Our meeting was at ISAF headquarters, in the middle of the city, with a Navy lieutenant commander and an intelligence specialist who was a Department of Defense civilian employee. One of the SUVs blew a tire on the way back, so our guards had to change it and form a perimeter to guard us while they did. My second trip to Kabul was with a different PM Russ employee, a more senior manager, Pat Simmons. That trip took a few days, and it included a very interesting trip to the outskirts of the city. I worked with everyone in the program as if their main interest was their work and our mission. I'd been warned that Pat could have other priorities, and that he had a history of causing problems for Lockheed employees, but I didn't take it seriously. 
One morning at breakfast, Pat and I discussed problems with varying balloon recovery procedures at the different sites. Pat agreed that that was something we should correct. There was a conference call every morning that was attended by P.M. Russ, Lockheed Martin, Central Command in Tampa, and Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Pat was on the call that day, and he brought up the issue about the inconsistent recovery procedures, which embarrassed the Lockheed people, one of whom was my boss. That led to me being removed from the Tiger team and my resignation from the program. After overcoming the consequences of stepping out of the chain of command in Baghdad, and then the promotion in Afghanistan, I thought I might actually establish a career with Lockheed. But the disappointment at the latest turn of events, together with the loneliness, isolation, confinement, sleep deprivation, and other stresses that were nearly constant, made deciding to go home an easy call, so I quit. I gave them plenty of notice, and they even kept me on for another two months back home to write procedures, but my time in the war zones had come to an end. The call from Danny in 2011 caused me to think once more about the time that I'd spent in Iraq and Afghanistan. I thought too about the broader effect and the recurring question, was it worth it? The answer is by no means apparent, but I choose to look at it positively and make that case. But I won't do that in this documentary. You'll have to ask me about that or read my book. Show me a 